So thanks, Maura, and thanks and all of you who are there at the meeting. I thought this single one slide is much better than talking through the whole COVID because to get a very good understanding of the pathophysiology would be better in terms of us putting our heads together in terms of prevention and control. So if you see the top option of this um, picture, the mild COVID, and you can see there uh, two days before the symptoms onset itself, you can see the virus load is peaking. And mm -hmm. when, the, when a patient is, or when a person is with symptoms, probably it is at day zero, what we call is the peak of virus, virus shedding. And at that point, in terms of a mild COVID, very often um, anyone, any person uh, may think, well, I'm feeling a little bit uneasy, you know, like, but I'm okay. But at, that is the point I think probably we are doing the worst amount of damage. So if you see from day zero <coughs> to day eight, you know, like, and it's a constant, uh, you know, water shedding, but, you know, like, you know, it's on the inverse curve where we are, you know, like, and by the time the inflammatory phase set in, sets in, day three, day four, you know, probably we might think, okay, now I have something I need to test or I need to take rest. But by the time we would have really, you know, like, you know, have a huge amount of viral shedding and probably infected many people at that point. So by day 14, day 15, or even by day 10, we can see that one, most of the mild COVID symptoms have abated. And most of the people would have recovered by day 14. So in terms of testing these patients, very often the testing will happen somewhere between day two, day seven, day eight, where you know we can see the virus detection happening, or it could be even tested, you know, like before immediately before the onset of symptoms. So this is the reason why when we are doing the prevalence screen, we can we come across many people who are carriers but asymptomatic. So the pure presence of the gene is what is detected subsequently. So that's symptomatic relief happening in two weeks' time, or even from day 10, you can see that most of the mild COVID symptoms are significantly abated and people do recover by week two, week three. However, if you look into the severe COVID, you know, like in the bottom part or the middle part of the picture, what you see there is, yes, two days before the symptoms onset, but the symptoms onset are comparatively slower, not acute, but it has a longer progression. And here you can see the blue line where the hyperinflammatory phase with all the complications do happen, probably around day four, day five, but significantly worsening situation, what we call stage two with shortness of breath and hypoxia. Moving into stage three, which is the ARDS and septic shock and multi-organ failure and all those complications you know, cooking up. So where when the patient is actually uh, presented in the healthcare, day five, day seven, day 10, and hyperinflammatory acute phase progressing very bad in most of the patients. And looking into this one from the, this is all based from an American um, publication that the admission to ICU is somewhere between day seven, day 10, or even later, where patients have progressed into stage three with showing all other complications, including the coagulation disorders and all these sort of things. So from an IPC end, when a patient is actually presenting to ICU, we, have, we go with airborne precautions, we go with full gear, okay? But in fact, if you see this viral shedding, at that point, probably the viral shedding is much lower or the, present, or the, or the, the million copies of the virus in comparison to day zero to day four, day five, when these patients had managed in the general wards or out in the community or in you know sub acute sub step down units, the viral load is much lower. <clears throat> However, we go with you know the full level of PPE, everything what is available in. I, I'm not commenting on what many people do, but if you compare between the mild COVID and and the severe COVID phase, where we should focus more is actually the predromal phase. Yeah. when we have high viral shedding. So push the message. If you feel sick, anybody, that's the point you are actually doing the damage and transmission. And this is the reason why mm. we had to more focus on control outside the ICU, 
uh, e even harder, you know, hitting the message in into general population and also patients who are in non-ICU settings. And there requires more focused IPC measures. Comments, queries, questions. <laughs> I totally agree with Tony. Uh, that's what actually we are pushing here. Even if it is anything that is unusual for a person, like it may be just headache, it may be just um, uh, sneezing. Even if they have sneezed twice, we ask them to stay at home, not to come into work and contact the GP and organize for testing. Because we don't know, the different people uh, present with the different symptoms, and some people do not have anything else. So it's always, that's what we are actually pushing. And I think it is working. Uh, people, you know, they they sit at home, they get the test, and if they are negative, then they come back. Some people, you know, even we encourage them if they are not very sick or, you know, they can, if they can work from home, we do that also, so that yeah. they are not taking their leave or, you know, so it is working actually. Yeah, I think I agree. I fully agree with that one because I think the science is there showing that when the viral shedding is is peak, at mm. when we are just starting the symptoms, you know, and there are thereafter, but the body is building up the immunity. So from day two or later, we can see that one antigen test could be positive, but definitely after two weeks. But by mm. the two weeks, what is left is the pure DNA, not the virus. Yeah. So again, I think the move to ten day quarantine or ten day restrictions of movement. Is more sensible in case of mild COVID, um, and and again in an ICU setting that could be delayed because patients post transplant, their hyperinflammatory syndrome could be is very often delayed. So any patients with altered immunity or you know whether it is a disease or or a medication, they could they could be carrying for slightly longer, but the viral load is low. They they, they could end up with more complications. But from an IPC end, I think out the ICU is the highest risk where we are actually causing more damage. And Tony, you know, I suppose the other side of it is and in the ICU setting, because these people are so much more acute and a lot of the time they're they're obviously ventilated and all those higher risk procedures are are being implemented. Do we know in relation to the evidence, is there a higher rate of transmission in healthcare outside of ICUs are attributable to ICUs? This is pure This is pure uh, observation only because this is not based on concrete data. Our first phase of the outbreak where we had uh, in our high dependency unit where these patients were managed, which is, which is default ICU for COVID at that point, on the initial four weeks, no single transmission. But then you can, and you can understand that when the, everyone was wearing the FFP2 mask while you enter the unit, long sleeve gowns, uh, eye protection and, and and gloves and enhanced cleaning with chlorine was going on. So in terms of the viral, you know, the millions of viral copies in droplets is much higher than aerosols because aerosols, again, very, very small particles, they have in comparison with the droplets, less viral load. But then the beauty of the, the droplets is that when they fall very quickly. So if you are close contact with somebody with an droplet transmission, their risk of acquisition is very, very high because the infective dose in a droplet is much higher than the infective dose what is in an airborne particle. Then you have to really consider about the efficacy of the mask and how the mask is used. Because even after going through an year of teaching how to wear the mask, we all forget it, or many scientific professional people forget it, you know, like and how to wear the mask. So I think the robust data on, on transmission in a particular setting will be more anecdotal than, than real science to prove that when this worked or that worked. But I think considering the viral load in a droplet, the viral load in, in aerosols, and what precautions we are putting there, you know, like in terms of respiratory protection, I still believe, and I go with the UK, and UK in the sense, you know, the His and Jip and the British Infection Association, surgical mask properly worn will do the job far better 